Well, what a treat we have for you. We often talk to our next guest via Skype in some grainy image where he's at an airport or in his living room, but he is here in Dublin. Kevin Cullen of the Boston Globe. Hello. Hello, Joseph. I think this is the first interview we've done in three weeks or three months in which I've had some pants on. It's a hell of a thought thought image. Yeah, it's a good yeah, image. Yeah, it's a great image. Uh, you're welcome to Dublin. What has you here? I'm doing some work. Uh, I was up in the north um, doing a story basically 20 years after the Good Friday Agreement. Um, not a retrospective as much as where are they right now, blah, blah, blah. So uh, I spent my, I basically spent a lot of time talking to old provos and loyalists, people who used to kill people, and now they just kill time. But the other thing, and I don't want to say the uh, A word, but that's what I'm doing. I'm doing something on the abortion referendum. Okay. So this is, it's interesting because there were people from Massachusetts who were actually involved in the anti-movement, so the anti-repeal uh, anti movement. Um, so very interesting from a Boston perspective, but also a lot of people in Boston are intrigued or interested about the whole idea of the, the amendment and what will happen. Are Boston people generally interested in what's going on in Ireland? Irish Boston mm. people, obviously. I think so. I mean, we still, Boston is not as Irish as it used to be, but Put it this way, 25% of the city population still claims Irish heritage. And there are towns like a town near me uh, called Marshfield, Massachusetts. 68% of the people, who, of the 20,000 people live there have uh, Irish ancestry. So it's still a, Boston is still the most Irish place in America. So it does matter. But it's funny, I was talking to a buddy the other day. Um, um, at, a, at, a, at my favorite pub here outside the city, Smith of Haddington Road, and we were talking about rugby, we were talking about this, but then he asked me, he says, was it a big story that Leo Varadka marched with his partner uh, in the parade in New York? And I said, I don't know, a couple of gay guys walking down Fifth Avenue doesn't strike us as newsworthy. No. It's just not a big deal. No. Oh, it's neither, I don't think. I mean, I, I, the, I, I didn't actually even fully realize he had. It's yeah, not, that was part of it. It was a big deal. Well, the, I mean, I wrote for years because in New York, they would not let openly gay people march up until... They, they may still be on them. I know we just they just allowed them in, in the South Boston Parade just two years ago. The first openly gay person marched in the parade. And you guys, Christ, gay people have been marching openly in parades from the length bread that breadth and length of the country for 20-something years. So the Irish are actually cooler about homosexuality than the Americans are. Because in America, you have, like, look, look at the vice president, Mike Pence. I mean, yeah. he thinks you can pray the gay away. Mm. So, I mean, we I, that's another thing. Man, I'm going off on tangents, Joe, but if we get rid of Trump, then we have Mike Pence. So it's not exactly a great deal. Is Boston as sports mad as it's, ever? Because it's generally regarded as perhaps the most sports mad city in America, which is yeah. a pretty big statement. I'd say, objectively speaking, I'd say it comes down to Boston and Chicago. Okay. Chicago people are kind of cuckoo. Interesting. Another Irish stronghold. Yes, exactly. Um, and I'd, I mean, bo the difference is Boston has been far more successful. There's been no city in America that has had more championships in the last... 20 years. I'm trying to think of when the, the um, you know, when the uh, Patriots won in 2002 mm. and then the Patri then the Red Sox broke the curse of 86 years, which gives heart to people in Clare. Um, oh, I'm sorry, people in Mayo. Actually, the Clare mm. hurlers came when they finally won mm. in the 90s. Mm. And I don't, I don't know what they, it was a long time before since Clare had won and they came and I actually hung around with the team and of course they were on the piss <laughs> and they um but it, we people in boston took great comfort that if claire could break their curse clearly the hurlers and claire could break their curse eventually the red sox did it took us another nine years mm. but the red sox broke the curse and won after 86 year drought in 2004 and then the patriots kept winning super bowls and the red sox won three championships between 2004 and 2000 and um when was the last one 2014 so the year of the marathon bombing, whatever that was, 13, I guess. Um, and then, so the Patriots win five Super Bowls. Red Sox win three World Series championships. Celtics win a championship. Bruins win a Stanley Cup. Mm. And there's no other city in America that comes close. So in terms of 
I think people in Chicago are just as passionate. It's like I always say, if you talk to somebody in Chicago or Boston about sports, even the little old grannies know about sports. What's going on? Yeah. If you go to places like New York, there's just a, such a diversity of people that you, you'd find people that was like, I don't know anything about this. Mm. But Boston and Chicago are the two towns. The real difference over the last 20 years is, you know, since the Bulls, Chicago haven't really, since that Jordan era when they won a bunch, They've not done anything. The, St- the, the, the Blackhawks have won at least two, if not three, Stanley Cups that I can think of in the last 20 years. And obviously the Cubs broke the curse. Yeah. And the White Sox won the World Series, I want to say 2007 or something like that. So Chicago has had some success, but probably half of what Boston has had. And so if you take the Red Sox, <clears throat> uh, the Bruins in ice hockey, uh, the Celtics, mm-hmm. and obviously the Patriots, is there a commonly regarded uh, people's team? Like, does the city home a little better if one of those is doing better than the other? I think the the, the town responds to all teams. Um, the Bruins less because that would hockey would be... If you go into the African-American community, into the um, Hispanic communities... To, Hockey just doesn't resonate the same way. There aren't many African American um, or Latino players in the National Hockey League, so it just doesn't resonate. But I think whether it's the Red Sox, the Celtics, or the um, Patriots, the entire city—not and it's not even the city. It's it's like here, Dublin is not just the city. It's the Greater Dublin area, just as the Greater Boston area. You're talking about three million people. And they're all sports nuts. Mm. They're mad, mm. and um, and they're also v- unliked across the country because of the success. And and re- I mean, Boston fans have a reputation of being arrogant, mm-hmm. and part of that is true. Yeah, it, it arrogance, uh, hubris comes with winning. And who could be more arrogant than Bill Belichick? I mean, nobody is more arrogant than him. And I think he kind of. I know that. Certainly the Patriots are the most hated team in America. And their ratings are extraordinarily high in nationally televised games. But that means that 97% of the people who are turning in are watching to see them lose. Yes. So it's sort of like the any, anybody but United mentality. Just actually you know? took the words out of my mouth yeah. during the 90s. That was alive and well. Even and you know I'm a United supporter, yeah, so yeah, don't go even, there. Even at England games with about five or six Manchester United players in the team, or certainly the Correct. squad, there was a stand-up if you hate Man U yeah. kind of a thing going on. Yeah. So we won't be able to play all of this out tonight, but we asked you just for the hell of it, mm-hmm. seeing as you're here in person, okay. uh, to pick out three Bostonian sports people I know they're not all necessarily from Boston, right? But um, who have uh, loomed large mm-hmm. in Boston sports history. So uh, you've done that for us in between going around to the pubs of Dublin. We appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, you do your research one way; I do my research another. <laughs> yeah, uh, you've saw you've sought out inspiration in the pubs of Dublin. So Ted Williams mm-hmm. is uh, who you're going to tell us about first. Uh, you say Williams, the greatest pure hitter of all time. No question. And a mercurial uh, figure as well, Ted Williams. So. Uh, he played basically for the guts of 20 years for the Red Sox between 1939 and 1960. Yes. Last player to hit 400. Um, it's one of those one of those things like with Joe DiMaggio's 56-game hitting streak. It will be extraordinary if that's ever equaled. Um, what you have to do to hit 400 is just crazy. The, the other really interesting thing about Williams is that he lost five years of playing time because he served uh, in both World War II and the in the Korean War mm. as a he was a Marine pilot, which is pretty extraordinary. And he flew a lot of combat missions. The fact that he got back here, I ended up meeting his wingman once, the guy that flew with him in Korea. And the guy was, he's you know, he said, "Geez, Ted was quite a storyteller." He said, "We'd be up there, and he'd be talking to me instead of talking about like combat stuff. He'd be talking about like." Bob Fella throwing fastballs at his head. And uh, the other thing that's really remarkable about Williams is that he was one of the staunchest advocates for um, integrating the game. And the Red Sox turned out to be the last team in um, baseball to do that when they hired. They, the Red Sox had a shot. They had a tryout with Jackie Robinson in 1946, and it turned out it was a, it was a farce. Mm. The Red Sox didn't want to sign this. Pinky Higgins, the um, the manager at the time, was an out and out racist, a virulent racist, and w- w- it, that's that issue is burning in Boston very strongly right now because John Henry, who happens to own my newspaper, so he's my I guess he's my titular boss, and he also owns Liverpool 
yeah. Liverpool Football Club, and he also owns the Boston Red Sox. John Henry announced that he wants to remove the name T- Yawkey Way, which is the main drag that goes up to the, through the Red Sox Fenway Park, because he believes that Yawkey was a racist, mm. and he thinks it tarnishes the legacy of the Boston Red Sox. It's a big hullabaloo, because some people want it that, to re- remove the name, and a lot of other people think that the, the the racist rap on on Yaki is unfair and exaggerated, and it's the Yaki organ the Yaki Foundation is one of the biggest philanthropies um, philanthropic organizations in Boston, and most of their money is put into either medical care, cancer care, and but most of it is actually put into minority communities, and the, the board is run by an awful lot of people, including Reverend Ray, Ray Ham and a friend of mine who's an African American minister who was very opposed to taking the Yawkey name off. So it's very controversial, but it, I would love to know what Ted Williams thought about that because, again, Williams was ahead of his time. He was a big supporter of um, uh, the Negro Leagues, which is what when baseball was segregated, and he said that he said that Satchel Paige was the greatest pitcher he ever saw. And he said Larry Doby was one of the most underrated players. It, it's, he just had a good heart. He was way ahead of his time. Where was he from? He was from San Diego. Okay. Um, and um, and he was just a, a pure... He, he was the first person to approach hitting as a, as, as, as a science. And he, and he did put like scientific metho- methodology into the way he hit. And basically he defined the strike zone in his head as and he actually, I remember it was a kid, I got a book that he wrote, and it was about the, he would have the, the plate where the ball came over, and then he would identify these zones where if he, if he got the ball here, he hit 480. If he hit, hit it on the outside of the plate, which is a pitcher's pitch, and down and away, mm. he hit 230. And he had, it was just, he approached this like no one had ever, I mean, frankly, baseball players were, were uneducated and um, very often just ignorant of anything like that. Ted Williams, again, he was a scientist. He was the first baseball player that approached hitting as, an, as, a, as the art of science mm-hmm. and the art of hitting. And, uh, and he, he wasn't much of an outfielder. The other thing about Ted Williams, I remember uh, one of his, uh, his fans telling me this when we were working on, of all things, the Whitey Bulger story about the gangster mm-hmm. and trying to portray him. Billy Bulger, the, the politician, was um, a great fan of Ted Williams and described how he got a, a he got a um, autograph from him when he was about twelve years old. And he said, "I thought Billy said it very well." He said, "Ted Williams would, you know, he would he could be in a stadium where thirty nine thousand people were cheering him, and Ted would hear the one who was booing." That's an interesting point because, um, as I understand it, Williams famously had a complicated relationship with fans to the point where I was just uh, even reading this afternoon mm. he stopped tipping his cap mm-hmm. after home runs became almost a, a stoic cold yeah. figure on the field Ted Williams in spite of his brilliance so Correct. that's quite a difficult one for the fans to navigate well again this goes to his personality that was very mercurial so he didn't like that some fans booed him and so he basically his punishment was to treat all fans with disdain and he he treated sports writers worse. He was notorious for basically having, I think he had fist fights with some of them. And uh, but he wouldn't talk to some guys. And he just he was the sort of and again he was the first superstar that started doing that. Because I saw he maintained a career long feud with Sport Magazine. I presume yes. a, pr- a pretty big deal. Yeah. Uh, a career long feud with him. So we're talking about a guy who started playing in thirty nine through yeah. to nineteen sixty. So in nineteen forty eight. He said, I ain't speaking with you guys anymore because they had a, a quote from his mother, probably yeah. innocuous enough, right. but he felt his private life was his private. private. Life, yeah. right. That was the kind of guy he was. And um, there's a great, great, um, there's some great images when the Red Sox, I was actually living in Ireland at the time. In 1999, the Red Sox hosted the All-Star Game at Fenway Park and they wheeled Ted Williams out onto the field and all the greatest players in the game came up and embraced them individually. And one of the most moving ones was Tony Gwynn, who was a terrific hitter. Tony died, sadly, very young. He was a tr- And Tony was the one that came closest to hitting 400. I think he hit 380-something one year. And what is 400 for a day? A forehand would, would be, if you get up um, 10 times, that means you get four hits. Um, like, again, baseball is one of the few sports in which the greatest players fail 
seventy percent of the time yeah. at the plate. It's very unusual like that. So um, anyway, Tony Gwynn basically the, it, the embrace was really long, and people asked Tony Gwynn after he said, "I feel like I'm standing here because of Ted Williams." That uh, or, or that and that my dad particularly. I think he met his dad because his dad was a, a pro ball player and was one of the you know he would have been in the first five or six years mm-hmm. of. Uh, of when baseball was integrated. So, I mean, the love that Tony Quinn had for him was really true and pure. And uh, and Tony came up to um, Boston for the memorial service when Ted died. Um, and then Ted's death, even in death, I mean... When did he die? Oh, God, you'd have to tell me. I forget. It was a long time ago. Right. Sometime in the 2000s, early 2000s, I think. But his son, John... Um, John Henry, it's funny enough, that's his name, John Henry, John Henry Williams. John um, wanted, missed his dad so much and longed for his dad so much that he, they decapitated Ted Williams and froze his head. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. And then poor John gets sick with cancer and dies very young. It's just, it's, I always thought it would be a hell of a biopic. Is the head still frozen? The head is still frozen. Where is it? It's in some laboratory in Arizona. Why? <laughs> My wife told me she's going to put me in there. <laughs> she I, said you can be next to Ted. Your 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 hero. You can, you can be with Ted Williams. Uh, well, there you go. So is he is he heroic and dare I say it loved in spite of the atmosphere with the fans? I think. <sighs> Anybody like me, I this guy was my hero. I never saw him. I never saw him play a game. He played his last game when I was two years old. And by the way, adding to the legend, last at bat, home run. Uh, so he why is he forty two years old? Why is he your hero then? Just because of every, when I was a kid, I read books about baseball. I read. I was actually a crap player. Um, good glove, no 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 hit. That's what they used to call me. Good mm. glove, no hit. I could catch anything. Mm. I was fast, but I couldn't hit a I couldn't hit a curveball. I was terrible. In fact, my nickname on my American Legion team it was a ama- to make an American Legion team. That's like after high school. So between high school and college, you have to be a pretty good ball player. And I remember Mr. Lockhart, the coach, picked me, and all the other kids said, "Cullen sucks. He can't hit." Mm. And by Johnny Furlong, the shortstop, nicknamed me after the third game was. Um, when you strike out, they put a K in the in the in the score book. So my nickname became Special K, <laughs> like the cereal. Yeah. I think I struck out seventy times that season. I was just horrible. My average, I think I hit one eighty something. Yeah. So. So Williams is obviously. But Williams is he's there. just a he's a legendary player, a legendary man. He was a warrior. I mean, I just don't. There's is it nothing, the war, war hero still? Was a war hero. He genuinely. I mean, he flew a lot of combat missions and shot down a number of Japanese fighter jets during the um, during the Second World War. I mean, he's an extraordinary guy. Did he soften post um, yeah. retirement and, and yeah. open himself up a bit more? He did. He and that, it's funny because we're going to talk about Bill Russell after. Same thing. Bill Russell had a very diffident, contentious relationship with fans and writers and all that stuff. They were very similar. I I don't know. I don't think they ever met. Right. But I think that Ted Williams and Bill Russell would have really got on. Got on. Yeah. Okay, and their mutual disdain for exactly. They said the that they would man. know what it's like to be great and have to deal with all these the arseholes. Yeah, he never won. He never. I mean, he never won a, w- a World Series. Obviously, with no. the, the, the eighty-six years and no. the curse and everything, he played in one uh, World Series and they lost that. Yeah. So. And uh, why? Why was Williams not picked up by the Yankees or someone? That was back in an era nobody tra- you with the team for life. Okay. That was before free agency. Free agency came in the nineteen seventies. So was he kind of stuck with them? Whether he liked it sort or not? of, sort of. I mean, there were trades, and the most famous trade was when the Red Sox unloaded a very good pitcher named Babe Ruth yeah, sure. to the New York Yankees, which began the curse. Yeah. Um, but no, the other the other thing about Ted Williams is David Halberstam, who was one of our greatest journalists and writers, wrote a book called. Um, the teammates, and he was very close with Joe um, Dom DiMaggio, who was Joe DiMaggio's brother, and obviously played it. it Joe Dom DiMaggio was a great player. He was not his brother, mm-hmm. but he played. I mean, he was an all star. He's um, was a terrific player. The other guy was Johnny Pesky, and Johnny Pesky was very unfairly labeled as um, there was a in the nineteen forty six series on a basically a single. Enos Slaughter for the for the Cardinals kept running. He never stopped. And Johnny went out to the outfield and took the, the cutoff throw. 
And then he looked, and he looked too late. By this time, Slaughter had, had rounded the third and was heading for home. Pesky threw the ball, and he beat the throw. Mm. And there was always the rap, Pesky held the ball. Mm. Instead of um, Havlicek stole the ball, which was the famous call for basketball, uh, Pesky held the ball. And Ted was very defensive. And when Raiders would bring that up, he would bite their heads off. Mm. Very defensive, Johnny Pesky. And the, th the third player that was very close to him was a guy named Bobby Doerr, Hall of Famer. One of the, the lowest hitting Hall of Famers of all time. I think his average was about 283, but he's a terrific defensive player. But basically, he made the Hall of Fame because everybody in baseball said Bobby Doerr made everybody around him better. And he's just a class, class guy. He just recently died, Bobby. And I wrote a story about um, when he came back to Fenway Park for the last time, I had lunch with him and Pesky. And they talked about their wives. And Ted, I think, had three marriages. And Ted, his friends, his best friends, Don DiMaggio, uh, Johnny Pesky, and Bobby Doerr were married to the same women their whole lives. And when I totaled up the years that they were married to these women, it was, it was like 175 years. It was crazy. They were married, all of them were married for like 60 years. To the, and in Johnny's Ruthie, he said, my Ruthie died two years ago and I miss her every day. And Dom DiMaggio's wife, um, Marion, she's a doll. She, Dom was sick. He couldn't come up. He was um, confined to basically a wheelchair at home. And then, pet, um, what do you call it? Um, uh, Bobby Doerr's wife, what was her name, Evie? Bobby Doerr's wife had died recently too, and they had been married for like 68 years. They're just extraordinary human beings yeah. beyond their their baseball ability. And yeah. William, and the fact that they those good solid guys were friends with Ted Williams, and he was fiercely protective of them. It, it just it was just another part of the the Williams lore mm. that this crazy mercurial guy would have the most stable decent guys in the in the locker room as his friends. You can judge people by their friends sometimes. Maybe I agree. That's a sign. Yeah, totally yeah. Agree. So uh, and I know he got the Presidential uh, Medal of Freedom in ninety one from George Bush. He did. Yeah, Bush. So. Um, uh, a final point on Williams: Is he like revered to this day? Are there Ted Williams statues around Fenway? Is it that kind there of thing? There is a Ted Williams statue yeah. outside of Gate B in um, in Fenway Park. Yeah, I think Williams is one of those guys that because people that didn't like him for the mercurial start because they've all died off like him. Yeah. His re his reputation has been rehabilitated. The bottom line is anybody who's a serious baseball fan will tell you he was the greatest hitter of all time. No one has come close. No one has been able to match the average with the power. Usually when you're a power hitter, your average suffers because you're taking big cuts. You're not just going for singles, going dinking the ball. Yeah. You're trying to hit the ball out of the ballpark. What was Babe Ruth? Babe Ruth, in terms of what... He was both. He right. was a high average hitter. He was a 300 hitter. And... Um, but no but one Williams had, was a 400 hitter. Williams, well, no, one season he hit 400. His right. career average, I don't... To, off the top of my head, I don't know what it was. Ruth never managed 400 a season, did he? No, no, he never hit 400. Right. And the, the other thing about the, the home run numbers, um, 521 for Ted Williams, yeah. he lost five full seasons. With the wars. With the wars. Yeah. And those were his prime years. Right. So you average, if you average, I think he averaged about 40 home runs. There's another two home run, 200 home runs. He hit 721 home runs, which is five more than Babe Ruth. Okay. And he didn't take steroids. <laughs> yeah, which, you know, can't be said for everyone, to can't say the very least. Uh, thanks for telling us about Ted Williams. We are going to play out another night you talking to us about Bill Russell and Bobby Orr. But Kevin Cullen, enjoy Dublin. Good man. Thanks, brother. Good to see you.